Hi, I'm Stacy Stone, and this is Jamie Rogers, and together we coordinate Morning Morning to Life, uh, the tagline for our community. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here to learn more about experiential learning and how to improve what you're already doing. Um, I wanted to take a moment to, first of all, to thank the uh, faculty of the Center, especially Lillian Murray, Cammie Kane, and Justin Patton, who are basically working right now anyway, for um, hosting this and inviting all of us to put together such a wonderful breakfast and lunch. We were here last night for the dinner. So thank you so much. Um, also, um, I wanted to thank the people who have been involved in the QEP, and I want those who um, have ideas to see who is on this leadership team. So if you're on the QEP leadership team or on the QEP advisory committee, would you please stand, or on the uh, scoring committee, scoring the reflection statements, would you please stand so that everyone can see their representatives on these bodies. Thank you. Um, thank you for your work. And again, if you have ideas, um, please contact us. There is a website, marystate.edu slash QEP, and at the bottom it says contacts, and you can email Jamie, you can email me if you have ideas, if you have questions. We welcome your advice, suggestions, and questions. Um, as you know, the QEP is on spiritual learning, and we appreciate the president, um, President Davies, incorporating experiential learning into the strategic planning assessment process this year, what used to be III, it's now it's, it's on experiential learning this time, um, just to highlight really all of the great work that we're already doing. And I'm so glad that as a university, we chose that topic for the QEP because it gives us a chance to really enrich and enhance what we care about and what we're doing. And we see it in schools and colleges, departments across the university. Um, programs as diverse as engineering and philosophy to nursing and music. And we have it in the classroom, outside of the classroom, engaging the community. We have um, accounting students helping people with their taxes. We have um, foreign language students teaching children foreign languages in clubs after school. And we have all of us, except for maybe for nursing, have certification programs and we have our students in so many schools. So we're already doing so much. Um, one thing that Jamie and I wanted to mention though, because last night this came up a few times, that we have um, part of the QEP is this experience rich activity. And it's an effort to encourage all programs to provide an opportunity for students who are interested in engaging in experiential learning. However, that's not the sole piece of our quality enhancement plan. It's just one part of it. And we want there to be experiential learning at all levels, all different types of experiential learning. Um, we had to define it for the ERA, and that's where we're assessing. However, we are hoping to see even more experiential learning opportunities across campus and better ones. Um, and when I say that, I, I just think that there's always room for improvement. Um, I use experiential learning in some of my courses and I know that where I falter and where I can improve is reflection. And so that's why I'm excited that we have a speaker who's going to talk more about that. Um, and Jamie is going to introduce it. And he may even add what I just said. I won't add because I think Stacy did a great job explaining that. Um, again, just because we've defined, I guess I am adding, but just because we define experience, experiential learning in a certain way doesn't mean we're gonna put it in a box. You understand that definition for you and your discipline, and that's what we're here for is to help facilitate that, help you to improve that in any way that we can. So if you have questions about that, then that's what we're here for. So reach out to us, reach out to those committee members that sit. So um, I have the opportunity to introduce our speaker this morning, um, Dr. Greg Lorenz. He um, was recently elected as vice president of the National Society for Experiential Education. Um, and that's actually an organization that we've become aware of and been much more active in as a university um, since we looked at this topic um, and where we first got to meet him. Um, he currently serves as the chair of the College of Arts and Sciences and associate dean of academic affairs for the Johnson and Wales University Denver campus. And before that, he served as their dean of experiential education 
where he focused on their internship program, which serves over 4,100 students a year. So, um, and their campus is kind of a, a nationwide um, campus with campuses spread across um, different regions. Um, he also oversaw a university-wide comprehensive internship assessment system <coughs> as part of their strategic plan. I say that to say that he understands where we're at. He's been in this place, understands we're looking at experiential learning, we're doing it, but how can we do it to a better extent? How can we centralize it? How can we equip people to do it well? So he's been there, um, he's had approaches to do that, and that's what he's gonna share with us today. Um, he's presented to numerous professional community and student um, groups, including the World Association for Cooperative Education, and numerous um, NSW annual conferences. And not to put, put undue pressure on him, but the first time I met him was in a workshop, and that workshop was over three hours long, and he kept us all engaged, every single one of us engaged, for three hours. Okay, so um, very energetic, very enthusiastic, um, and we are very fortunate to have him here with us. So please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Greg Lawrence. How is everyone? Can, can you hear me? Yeah. I have this thing on in here, this, this mic. Um, Dr. Rogers, Dr. Stone, thank you very much. Thank you for all of you for having me again uh, this morning. Uh, I didn't scare you off last night. Too bad, so I think there's a good turnout today. Um, but uh, I just want to reiterate uh, how thankful I am to be here and for you to invite me into your, your family for the, the last couple days. And, um, it, as I said yesterday, it is warmer uh, here than it is where I'm going. I had the chance to meet a student yesterday. Uh, she's in the communications department and she's getting ready to graduate and going to graduate school. And one of the schools she's looking at is University of Colorado. And I didn't tell her anything about the weather. I just said it's a wonderful place to be. And it's generally warm for the you know, nine months out of the year. So, uh, so how many of you, raise your hand, how many of you were here last night? If you were here last night, okay. We have some folks that, that uh, that weren't able to make it that are here this morning. So this is really an extension of what we talked about yesterday, really kind of getting into a little bit more on the reflection piece. And, and you saw that the reflection was one of those uh, principles of practice that we, we shared that, that document last night about the National Society for Experiential Education. So this is one of those principles of practice that we're gonna dive a little bit uh, farther into. Before we do that, I'd like to just get a sense from you, from, kind of from last night, what, what were some of your insights? What were some of your takeaways? What were some of the, the ideas or the, the, the thoughts that, that came to you uh, as you left or overnight or this morning, uh, if you've had a chance to think about anything? Yeah. Kathy? Yeah, Kathy from nursing. I think um, I've always believed in experiential learning, and um, sometimes you always have to evaluate what you're doing. <laughs> you always have to evaluate what you're doing and what you're expecting from the students. And I think it gave me a personal look at a structured way for me to be better so that I get what I really want from the students. You know, so it gave me a way to look through each one of those steps so that what I'm expecting from the students I'm going to get. Sure. I think sometimes they give you what they think you want, not really what you want. Right. Maybe we're at fault of that. So sure. it gave me a way to plan my course a little bit better through that structure. Okay, great. Yeah, <coughs> don't leave them guessing. Let them know what, what the parameters are. And, and, uh, anybody else? There's no pressure now. We have a microphone that you have to hold and <laughs> speak loudly. I think one of the things that I uh, heard in some of the conversations this morning and last night was that um, you're doing it. You're already doing this thing called experience <coughs> learning. You're doing it in different ways. You may, you may not be using the language that we used last night. You may not have thought about it in, in such a structured way or, or from that perspective, but you're already doing it. And again, if, you know, and sort of on the introduction, that the, the ERA is one component of this, but if you want to create a culture around experiential learning, it has to be happening in lots of different ways, lots of different forms. And think about it from the student's perspective there. But you're already doing it, so that's, that's something to, to that's, that's a great thing. Uh, what, what else? Any other takeaways, insights, reflections? Yes. So this will just be a very brief comment, but uh, I really like this, the model that was the spiral, because it picks up on just what you were talking about, where uh, 
there can be um, smaller bits of experiential learning throughout the student's career punctuated with um, larger kind of capstone or ERA type experiences. But the idea is to make sure that throughout the student's experience, in the four, five, six years that they're here, that they have um, plenty of opportunities to experience um, and, and have, have those active learning um, type experiences. Sure, thank you for that. I think um, when you're designing, I'm trying to imagine where you're at, and if you're in a program and you're talking about, uh, you have your colleagues around the table talking about how, what is this ERA that we're going to do, or we already have that, but what else do we want to do? looking at it holistically, looking at it from sort of the outside looking in and what, from different perspectives, from not only your perspective as the faculty member or the department, but also from the student's perspective, might help shape the structure for what you want there uh, to happen. Um, okay, so, so that's good. Well, one of the other takeaways that I, I had was that um, because it's happening in so many different ways here, you might want to consider sharing your practice with each other. As we heard, and one of the, the intentions yesterday was to, to have people share out and, and talk about the things that they're doing. There's good things happening, so how can you help each other? And I know there's a risk to that, because you don't really know um, if it's the right way or if it's the best way, or you sort of open yourself up. Uh, some of us were talking about that this morning. You sort of open yourself up to <laughs> some criticism. But if there's a piece of it that you think might be valuable, whether it's the continuous improvement piece or the assessment piece or um, you know, just struggling with what are different examples. Think about talking to, to your colleagues in different areas and just sitting down or creating those platforms to exchange ideas, whether it's brown bag lunches or coffee or, you know, I know those things are hard to make and, you know, schedules and so on, but if it's already happening, don't feel like you have to look outside the institution for these things. Look inside first and, and really just go into it with this, you know, kind of the old Nike commercial. Just do it. Just try it. Just do it and, and see where it goes from there. Okay, and so this morning, let's let's make this um, interactive. Feel free to feel free to ask questions. Um, we have a couple activities built in, um, and let's just kind of get going. So, the roadmap for today: what we're going to do, uh, we're going to just cover some brief foundations of reflection. Um, we'll really get into more of the strategies and mechanisms uh, for designing reflective activities. So, again, going back to that idea that. You are designers of learning. You are designing the experience, the learning experience for a student, whether it be in the classroom, whether it be for a program over a longer period of time, whether it's a semester or even a longer time. Um, what are some of the strategies and mechanisms that you can use? And so I'm going to ask you to think about or identify an example that you're using now or that you want to. Some, if you had to implement some experiential activity, whether it be next term or you're doing it this term, and, but you have to kind of think about some of these examples to really make this worthwhile um, for you. And then um, we're going to experience some different modes of reflective activity today. And um, I'm not sure how that's going to go, <laughs> to be honest with you. But we'll try it. And, and it's more about the process of experiencing those modes of reflective activity. It's less about what you talk about, what you write about, what you it's not about the content in this case, although when we work with students, we want it to be about that content. This is more about for you to experience some various modes there. So, um, so first thing, we have some, some notepads on your table here um, and pens, and, and please feel free to use those and leave them after you leave, after we're over, we're done today, leave those on the table here. Um, so, talking about reflection, what's, just, just think, yourself, what, what comes to mind? What, what are the, the words, the, the, the ideas, the concepts, the images that come to mind when you hear the word reflection? Well, just go with question one right now. Don't worry about question two. And we can just, just write them down or you can shout them out here. Let's just... Mirror. A mirror, okay. Water. Water, okay, good. Some imaging going on. What else? Thinking. Thinking, okay. Writing. Writing. Okay, yes. Like looking back with a purpose. Looking backwards with a purpose. Okay. I heard somebody else say something. Break your foot. Process. Process. Okay. Insight. Insight. Good. Solitude. Solitude. Give me more on that. Um, that it's difficult to reflect. Sometimes it's a group. You have to have some, some space. Mm -hmm. It's a group. Your experiences and your impressions. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I can come that back to that. Sitting on the front porch with a glass of ice tea and just <laughs> <laughs> reflecting. Can we do that afterwards? Can we go like, over? <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> well, real quick, what, what comes to mind? Introspection. Introspection. Internalizing. Internalizing. Okay. Great. Okay. That's good. That, and and, and yeah, some of you who may not have said anything, um, maybe in that place of reflection is um, it's touchy feely, cheesy, it's not important. It's, um, you know, if you're in one of those linear black and white areas, it's sort of in the middle and, and you, you know, we're not really sure about how valuable it could be. I, I understand people are there and, and that's okay. Um, Going back to your part about solitude, that reminds me, I, had a, I sat in on a, uh, a class the other day with a new adjunct teaching math, and it was 7.30 in the morning class, and he was just going and going and going, and they were talking about probability and all these, just going, and I was thinking about this, because this was on my mind, but he didn't allow the students to have any space, any time to slow down the learning, to sort of process anything, they just kept going, and you know, definition, um, uh, examples, try it, but there was no time to just slow it down, whether it would in the classroom, in the moment, or just over time throughout the semester. And I think that's a piece of reflection too, that in a way it gets to just slowing down that learning, having some time to, to think about it. Um, and so, you know, he was worried about getting through the content. And we had a great conversation afterwards um, that for both of us I thought was really helpful about how can we do some of these things. Okay, so now, think about this to yourself first. How do you currently use reflection as a faculty member personally and with your students? So how do you personally use reflection? And then how do you use it in your teaching and learning area? So think about that for a second. Then I'm going to ask you to talk at your table and share how you are currently using it. And if you're using it in different ways, that's great to share it and share the multiple ways you're using it. So after you've had a chance to think about that, share at your table. How do you use reflection personally? And if that's too personal, then just talk about how you use reflection with your students.
Conversations happening. I, I had a chance to, to kind of bounce around and hear some of the things that were going on. And I'm sorry to cut your conversations off because I, I hope that yesterday and today are catalysts to just continuing these more of these sorts of conversations. Um, how are you using reflection currently? Would, would anybody want to share? We won't do too many of these, but two or three. May want to share how they're doing? What you're doing? is really in informal, but sure. um, I, I, I teach voice lessons to music majors primarily, and um, so I get to have the same students for, for sometimes three to four years over eight, you know, eight semesters of study, so one of the things I've gotten better at as I've become more senior um, <coughs> is um, making sure that I step back and say, okay, where are we compared to where you were two months into your freshman year, or where are we you know, compared to your senior year, compared to your sophomore year. So it, it's helped me um, give them some space to reflect back and say, hey, you know, I'm really pushing you really hard on this, but think how, how far you've come. Um, so that, that's something that, I've, again, as I've matured, it's gotten a little easier for me to do instead of just push, 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 fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this all the time. You have, you have to let them breathe and let them step back and, and feel their success. So it's a combination. And then the, the success is then motivated <coughs> to be able to push them harder. Sure, sure, that's great. Is okay. it's green. Just see all Sorry. I'll take it. Anybody else? Was it Canvas? I know it's not this one. It was earlier, but it'll work now. Yeah. All right, so I guess we just have to project. Um, in Canvas, if you're not aware of it, there's actually a faculty journal. So if you just wanted to reflect on your own teaching or what's happening in your class or things that you might want to improve next time around or so on, you can 
and have your own journal. It's within Canvas, so it's pretty handy. So that's one way to be able to reflect on your own teaching as a faculty member. That's right. And the, those insights that you gain can certainly apply to, to the students. Um, and that brings up the idea of artifacts and evidence of reflection, especially if you're doing it over time and having students reflect on their evidence of learning at the, at the point in time. So as whether they had recordings, or whether they had writings or whatever it was, first year, third year, having them go back and reflect. And, and um, e-portfolios have that capability too, and that's a good way to, to do that. I don't know if, if any of you are using those. Um, I think there's a lot of value in e-portfolio. There's a lot of work that goes into it too, and so I think there's, a, there's two sides to that, that story. Okay. Okay, I also heard over here, that, um, we've taught, we're assuming that reflection is taking place in sort of an, uh, a face-to-face -face environment, classroom, <coughs> but we also have online that happens as well, and or hybrid. So thinking about how that, the challenges with that happen, um, uh, but it sounds like you have, through Canvas you have lots of mechanisms to videos and... There's an e-portfolio um, portion too at Canvas. Okay. You have your students create e-portfolios in the Canvas. That'll be the next workshop. <laughs> good, good. Okay. So I love the quote from T. S. Eliot, the poet. We had the experience, but we missed the meaning. And if you can think about that with your students, it it, it just always comes back to me whenever I I'm thinking about experiential. Okay, we had the experience. And, and a, a colleague of mine said, you know what? I always do do this with my wife when we travel. He, he travels a lot. And he said, we always make sure that we don't just travel and come back and get back to our daily routine. We sort of think and talk about what did we learn? What did it mean? What was the value of that? But I think, you know, you can use this in a variety of ways, but for students, if they're having an experience, and does the experience have to be something that you've coordinated in your class? I, I don't think so. Does it have to be something that's part of your course? No. They have experiences all the time. And you could always use one of those experiences as small or as large as you want it to be. You know, think study abroad upon re-entry. They disperse, I would imagine, go to classes all, you know, in, in many of the, your colleges. If you know who those students are, that's an experience that they've had that they could use to, to deepen the meaning for themselves, but also from others, with others. So just, this, this always sticks with me. I, I love the quote, and I think it's something that is a simple way to, to not let us forget the value of the meaning there. So what I'd like you to do now is think about your first teaching experience. This was going to say your first college teaching experience, but I realized that it could be your first high school teaching experience. It could be as a graduate student. It could be, just, just think about that. So take yourself back. And now I would like you to, with your notepads, answer these questions. And, and don't spend a lot of time, but enough time. And we're not going to share these out. These, this is for you. Just go through. If you can't see these, let me know. for making you relive that experience for some of you. <laughs> and for some of you, it's probably a great experience. Uh, like I said, I don't want to go through and have you share it, except it, I think it would be interesting on the last piece there, any, any lesson that you learned from that experience that you've taken forward. Would anybody want to share a, a lesson you learned based on your first teaching experience? From the both of you, yeah. Um, I learned that it's important before you start off to figure out where you where everybody is, so bring it down to the basics and do that evaluation from where, so you can build from there, and then make sure that you diversify your style, because then, of course, everybody learns differently, sure. but, you know. Which gets us to our point last night, the uh, conversation we had last night. I learned that uh, teaching was not all about me, and that uh, students react to the humiliation of a teacher in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Okay, thank you. So, 
point here is that I wanted you to go through a, a critically reflective exercise, but it didn't have anything to do with, with the content of the class. It was sort of taking you back. And to make the point that all experiences are worthy of, of reflection, and you can use them in many different ways to connect them. And I think crafting and bringing students through that experiential learning cycle is, is the hard part, and that's the challenge. So let me just share this with you. So Kolb, you had, uh, Lily, I had him up on the video here as you were walking in. David Kolb, um, really sort of the, the author of the experiential learning cycle, and, and, and there's others, obviously, that, that were influential, influential there, which we'll talk about. Uh, and it's really hard to follow Cole too, so it's like following the Beatles in a way, if you're a musician. Uh, so we start with the concrete experience, which was the teaching, right? That, that, that first teaching experience that you had. Through this reflective ob observation part of the cycle, we're reviewing and reflecting on that experience. And I gave you some prompting questions to stimulate some of those, those reflective pieces. We're then learning, sort of concluding, drawing some conclusions from that experience and, and, and the learning that happened from that experience. And then we would, next time you teach, you kind of go through and you, you try out what you learned, those lessons you learned. And you do this on a daily basis. You don't even know it. Point here is that using this model, I took you through a cycle of questions that we started first by asking what the details were. No emotions in there, no interpretations, no judgments, just simply the facts. And if we were grading this or looking at it, if, if you had a lot of emotion in there, I would, I would give you feedback and say, let's focus on the details. Let's focus on the details, not to, you know, to kind of recall the, the experience. Then we can get into the feelings and the emotions and the judgments and the interpretations. So, just one example of a way that you can move a student through the experiential learning cycle using reflective questions, and I'll show you a few other models in a little bit here. Other questions? Feel free to ask questions as we go. Too. Okay, so quickly we're going to take a broad swipe at, at just some, some theoretical pieces of reflection just so you have this going forward. Not going to spend a lot of time here, but these are things you can reference later on, and, and many of you already have this information as background knowledge anyway. But um, referring to last night, reflection is a component of the, the eight principles of, of best practice. Um, and so it's definitely something, if we want to find the meaning in the experience, we want to make sure that the reflective piece is what, what brings it up. Definition, and I know we had some discussion after last night about what's the definition of experiential education and how does it match up with the Murray State definition. And my interpretation of that conversation is, um, and like you heard about earlier, experiential education is broad, and this is a good discussion point that you can maybe uh, take a definition of wherever you find it, whatever you're using, give it to folks to react to, but make sure you're using a similar definition. The ERA criteria are criteria and descriptions, but it's like you said, it's not the only thing that we want you to do. If it's going to be cultural, you need to incorporate experiential across the curriculum in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, another T.S. Eliot quote, which I, I think helps, um, giving some time and some space to that reflective reflective part. I'm thinking of study abroad or internship again. You know, it's hard in the moment to reflect. It's hard to understand where the learning is happening. But with some time, I think you, you can get a, a deeper and greater result. However, with too much time, then you sort of lose that opportunity there. So we'll get into when reflection is going to happen and, and have you actually design some of this, um, some reflective strategies here in just a couple minutes. Um, John Dewey you know, <coughs> talked about reflection as active, persistent, and careful consideration of beliefs. Um, Sarah Rogers is a Dewey scholar, and she summarized Dewey's perspective on reflection. And I really like the way she did it. Um, you know, it creates meaning. It's keeps that continuity of learning possible. It's sort of that, as long as the reflection is continuous and ongoing, or at least regular. It's a systematic, rigorous, disciplined way of thinking. And this is where I personally, it's communal, where it should happen with interaction with others. I think, you know, for me, I, I, would, I might give more if it was myself and the, and the instructor and the teacher. Because once you have to open it up to a broader group, 
for some people, probably the extroverts, it's no problem. If you're an introvert, that might be a problem. So thinking about that as you design your reflective activity is something to, to keep in mind. But at its best, I think um, it was designed to be communal or shared or at least social. And it requires the attitude that, um, of growth of yourself and others. So if you don't value growing and developing or if we can't get our students to understand the growth that needs to happen as a result of the learning, it, that's a challenge too. So I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, Schoen talks about um, reflection in action. This is sort of that reflective practitioner piece. Uh, getting back to the question I asked you about how do you reflect personally as a practitioner, as, as a faculty member. Um, we're talking about reflecting during the doing and after the experience. The, the work, uh, Where's the Learning and Service Learning by Eiler and Giles, I talked about a little bit last night. Um, they did a lot of research in, in, I think it was a FIPSI grant back in, in the late 90s, and that research showed that frequent reflection is a predictor of um, greater transfer of curriculum academic related knowledge. But moderate reflection, and I don't, I don't know what moderate is compared to frequent um, off, offhand, but that, that wasn't quite enough. So if we're just doing reflection at the beginning, as the ERA talks about, and then when they come back, that might not be enough. You might need to think about ways to build in reflective uh, process throughout the experience here. And back in 99, they talked about writing and discussion as, as great ways to, to bring out or to facilitate reflection. Patty Clayton uh, kind of gets into this idea of critical reflection, taking reflection as a step farther, and she really looks at uh, overlaying critical thinking principles onto reflection. And one way to talk about it, especially if you have folks who are thinking about reflection as touchy-feely and it's, it's not important, is how do you differentiate between that, I'm driving to work just thinking about my day or thinking about how things went, versus this academic-related reflection that we want to have in the classroom. And so she overlays critical thinking outcomes into the reflective uh, model. And her work is great. I have uh, the references on the slides and we'll, we'll distribute this to everyone. So um, she has great, great work. I, I really like it. It's very practical and useful and I think could meet a lot of your needs. She talks about reflection in terms of, uh, and we'll see it here in a second, personal growth, civic learning, and service learning. It, it, she, she talks about how it generates learning, deepens learning, and documents learning, um, you know, confronting biases and, and your values and, and any dissonance that you have with, with certain things that you've experienced, um, looking at alternative perspectives. These are all things that you do anyway. You're doing them in your class. I know it. We just didn't know that, you know, it's related to critical reflection. I'm not sure if you can see this. I hope you can to a reasonable extent. I really like this chart because it, it sort of talks about when we're talking about reflection, the differences here. It's not touchy-feely, or it shouldn't be, uh, when we're talking about reflection for our purposes here, although I think there's value in that sort of, let's just talk about what happened. If you're on an internship or you're uh, in study abroad or a service learning, there's room for those discussions as well. Um, but when we're talking about relating to learning outcomes, critical reflection is, is a little bit different. Stream of consciousness, diary entry. Uh, when I started my work as um, Dean of Experiential Education, I would go around and ask, I said, are we, are, how are we doing reflections? We have you know, 3,800 internships happening. Are we doing any sort of reflection? And the answer was yes. And then we looked into it, and it was, we kept logs of activity. We had students write logs of activity. What did you do today or this week? And just write it. And it was less, it was just a description of details. In activity, and it was less about what the student was learning. It was all about having the faculty advisor and the internship coordinator understand what the student was learning because they felt out of the loop because they weren't there with the student, and that was really out of a lot of discussions. That's what happened. So it was log of activity. It was not reflection, but we we said, well, we're keeping a journal, so therefore it must be reflection, and it was not. And so that allowed us to have better conversations about what we wanted it to be. Um, you know, it's not therapy, um, although I think we get some of that as well in some of our, our work. 
So I wanted to share that with you as just a way to differentiate between regular reflection. Now I want to show you an example and just tell me what you think about this. So let me just preface this. This um, I became familiar with this student's work through, uh, we were working on a FIPSI grant um, through a, a program called Connect to Learning, um, and it was about e-portfolios, essentially. There was about 25 schools in the country, community colleges, um, different institutions that were working on this, um, developing e-portfolio a model, and then launching the model to, to show schools how you could do it, what are the steps to, to launch an e-portfolio. Um, we were involved because we had some of the, the components. We didn't have the portfolio platform, and it was way too expensive at the time for us to use, even though our Blackboard system had a, an e-portfolio. It, it didn't meet our needs. But um, through some of this work, um, we got to, schools had to share different reflective sorts of uh, evidence. And this was one out of Boston College or Boston University, I can't remember. The, the context quickly is, She's a student in the first year program. I think it's the College of Arts and Sciences or Liberal, liberal Arts. Um, and they have this common first year curriculum that all students take. And so this is sort of at the end of that year, she is being assessed on, on her experience. And so after this is over, we'll just want to get your thoughts and your, um, your perceptions of, of what you thought about this here. So let's. So I'm going to start by giving an overall reflection on my first year at Boston University CGS. What stands out the most is that it was really exciting for me to develop relationships with my professors. There was definite respect established between um, me and basically all of my professors this year, so it felt really good to receive their validation. The small class sizes at the College of General Studies made it really easy to establish those relationships. I felt like I acclimated to college really well because of those small class sizes. So had I entered a different college, that was probably a lot more impersonal. Um, I don't think I would be able to look upon my year this fondly. I really think that the interdisciplinary experience was completely enriching. Um, one particular example was how when we were learning about World War I in my social sciences class, we were simultaneously reading some war poetry in my humanities class. So it was fascinating to be able to get the facts and the political angle in my social sciences class, compounding that with the raw emotional experience depicted in the poetry that we were reading in my humanities class. So moving on to the rubric criteria posted and how I've made progress within those certain fields. Um, for the gathering, analyzing, and documenting information component to the rubric, this recent research paper that I did for my rhetoric class, which was on psychoanalysis and whether it has a scientific foundation and can be considered a medical treatment. I did this paper and I it was the first time that I actually went to the library to consult a reference source and the reference source that I found was actually my most helpful source. It was a little bit difficult at first to try and sift through all of the sources that I had at my disposal but this was a really helpful experience because I'd never sifted through as many sources for a particular project as I did for this one research paper. So it definitely um, was a challenge to find certain peer-reviewed sources and um, journal articles, all while keeping my argument coherent. But it was, it was pretty helpful because <clears throat> we were given a lot of materials and databases and portals to find the information that was relevant to us. For the component, which consists of awareness of specific historical, literary, and cultural contexts. This is the area where I can honestly say I made the most progress simply because I've gained just so much exposure to so many new ideas during my first year of college that I've genuinely been fascinated by. So, you know, when you're sincerely inter interested in something, you have a better time retaining that knowledge in your mental reservoir, and I can say that that's what's happening to me. For example, I'm going to be taking a foreign relations class at Stanford University this summer and um, I'm positive that the various concepts which I learned in my Intro to International Relations elective this year will help me to take a really holistic approach in whatever assignments I'm going to be completing this summer in just a few short weeks. For the component of the rubric which consists of integrative and applied learning, 
Uh, an example that I have is the interdisciplinary paper between social sciences and humanities required me to apply a social sciences concept, and I chose Emile Durkheim's functionalist theory. I had to apply that to a piece of um, art, literature, film, whatever that we studied in my humanities class, and I chose The Burial at Thebes by Seamus Heaney. And it was a lot of fun to take a theory about how society ought to work and apply it to a fictional society from thousands of years ago. I posted the paper under interdisciplinary reflections in my ePortfolio if you are interested in reading it. Moving on to rhetorical and aesthetic conventions. We did a paper uh, first semester in rhetoric about gay marriage and we had to always consider our audience and really tailor our language to an audience that is going to disagree with certain parts of our argument, if not the entire argument. And it was a fascinating exercise to always keep in mind constantly who the paper was addressed to, so I definitely think I made a lot of progress in this realm because um, my job for many years back when I lived in California before coming here was doing door-to-door -door persuasion where I had to talk to people who didn't support marriage equality in hopes of convincing them to eventually support gay marriage. Um, but it's very different doing that in person because I can elevate my voice tone, I can smile, I can use gestures. So having to actually do a paper where I'm tackling a similar issue um, addressed to a similar audience was an awesome exercise because <clears throat> it helped me to focus on uh, nuances in language and things like that. The part of the rubric that I've been waiting to talk about is critical thinking and perspective taking. And I do believe I've made a ton of progress in this particular realm. So I think that thinking critically has always been a strong point of mine. Even as a little kid, my parents always told me to question everything and question authority as long as I question respectfully. So that's just something that I grew up with. But I think I was really able to hone in my critical thinking skills during my independent study sessions that I took on this semester with Professor Tyler, who's also my humanities professor this year. And the topic of the class happened to be transcendental writing and philosophy, but the nature of the directed study was such that we tackled so many big picture issues, such as what leads people to become complacent, why certain lifestyles are more appealing than others, um, what's the payoff in being an active participant within the community, and it really forced me to analyze my society and my role within my society in an extremely critical way. And I definitely think it's going to continue, which leads me into some goals for next year. Um, my main goal is mainly to continue to extrapolate everything that I'm told, everything that I read, everything that I learn to their logical conclusions. I want to be able to make enhanced connections between past and present in next year's social sciences classes, which are going to be very politically focused, and that excites me because I'm pretty into politics. I mostly want to keep a positive attitude and remember that no matter what I'm studying, whether I'm interested in it or not so interested in it, knowledge is knowledge and there is really no such thing, in my opinion, as useless knowledge. Be in hopes of convincing them to eventually support. seemed like it was a value rubric um, similar probably to the one that you're using for your um, for your ERAs and there's a number of value rubrics so that was that's what I had noticed too what else that's extremely atypical extremely atypical <laughs> right if we if all of our students could could be like that that would be wonderful yeah, so uh, yeah it, so smart, but what I was so impressed with was how she would tie what she learned in one class with what she learned in another class, and 
So, so connections, um, that's just you know, amazing how she was able to do that. Absolutely, the ability to connect concepts and courses and, and topics. She also wove in experience that she had previously in California. So it's tied in a previous experience to this. What else regarding the anything around the, the mode of, of reflection or, you know? So it looked like she was reading from time to time off to the side, so she cut and they was going to address the camera. So she took the time to write out her thoughts first and have them up there, but then she was able to then convey them verbally with the video. So mm -hmm. it looked like she had two components to her, her reflection. Sure. So that probably was her as well. And, and my take on that was, it was pretty authentic. It wasn't yeah. scripted where she was reading from a, a document. Uh, she had thought it out, but she sort of riffed at times and went off. Um, okay, what else? Yeah? There had to, at some point, been some sort of preparation for her Absolutely. from someone else, from a teacher, from an administrator. There had to, at some point, have been somebody to say, here are the things that are going to be expected of you. So start thinking about this now, not at the end. Mm -hmm. Not at the end of the freshman year did she start thinking about it. She started thinking about it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the way, she started making those connections early. Sure. So some pre, some some pre, uh, some preparation, orientation to what the year. So this is maybe a year-end assessment that she was doing. There were she probably had the rubric ahead of time. My understanding of the assignment is um, that she could have chosen to do this on video to write it. Or write it. It was those two. <coughs> She's clearly comfortable here, although she probably could have written something very well. I think we've touched on this before, saying she's atypical, but she's definitely somebody who wants to learn. She, she approached it with her own internal motivation to learn. Mm -hmm. Going back to one of the slides about um, valuing that interpersonal growth and development piece, a absolutely. Absolutely. It may be just how it's set up. She's had exceptional awareness of what she wanted to learn, what she learned. Absolutely. I think it's, it's Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a model, right? It's something, and you can actually find this on YouTube, so I, I um, um, it's there, and I, I think I have the link in here. Um, she, let's see, what else, what are the notes? Um, it was definitely integrative. Um, she was, have you ever had a student that was excited about a rubric? <laughs> no? I mean, come on. And, and she finished with goal setting, right? So, but, I like that for a couple of reasons because we're going to get into the different modes of reflection and we talked about writing and writing and discussion are obviously the, the two most common. But here's this other sort of video piece and we talked about social pedagogies last night just a little bit and this digital era, this, this uh, web-based culture where students are willing to share and maybe they're more comfortable, definitely more comfortable than we are as a mode to do that. But this, maybe that was, that was perfect for her. And so, something for us to think about in terms of the options we give students and the ways, and some of these, when, when students are out on study abroad or service learning, they're, we were talking to a graduate student last night, I don't know if she's here today, but she said, I have tons of pictures and videos from my study abroad experiences, and what are we doing with those? What, what is, she, she has them for herself, but maybe there's an opportunity there. Um, so, I just wanted to share that as, an, as something to think about. Is that touch and feel reflection, or is that critical reflection? probably more on the critical reflection side. So that's kind of where we're going with, with this and, and some of those differences. Um, two models I introduced last night and I want you to, I just want to reference them for you. They're in the reference section. Uh, Pam Kaiser, Elon University. What I love about this, and there are questions like I talked about last night. I don't have the handout for you, but Lily and I have talked about getting those for you. There, there's distinct prompting reflective questions at each point in this cycle, which could be really useful for you. I actually pulled some of them for the first uh, discussion that we did. I used some of those questions to move to move you around this cycle, and certainly you can you can do this. Notice that this is has more steps than the Kolb cycle. This has uh, six. Kolb had four, but it's still very similar. Here is Patty Clayton's deal model. Um, describe the experience. That's where just talking about details, not talking about interpretations or emotions examining the learning there. So you have three different options to go with. Civic learning, academic enrichment, which is mostly what we're talking about, and then personal growth. And I have an example here of certain questions that you can use.
function f8? Yeah, can we go bigger? Um, you can do the control. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so here are some examples of, um, and I'll give you the website for this as well. Describe, just talking about the, the specific questions to get a student to, put, to recall the facts of that experience. When did it take place? Where did it take place? And, and so on. So you don't have to make these up. I mean, that's often what happens is we're, we struggle with how to design things and what questions to ask. So from an academic learning perspective, you know, we're talking about academic material that's relevant. Certainly the student that we just saw pulled that in. Skills, um, you know, and so there's a number of prompting questions there. You don't have to use all of them, you can use some of them. And Patty Clayton in this deal model, she has students articulate their learning with four, four sentences, but four um, prompts. I learned that blank. I learned it when it, this experience, this learning matters because, and in light of this learning, I will do X, Y, and Z. And so she lays these out, and she has examples from service learning, from uh, study abroad, from uh, personal growth and development, and there's a whole number of, of areas that, that she has available. So I just want to give that to you to think about. For, for time's sake, we're going to move ahead and go in. That's the, her articulated learnings. Again, to that point, we we're talking about online learning um, and how do you teach reflection. Uh, I'm not sure if we teach it specifically or if we just build it into our work as, as faculty members. Um, in terms of creating those environments. So, I'd like, I think we have a couple handouts on this, reflection strategies. Um, I want you to think about an experience that you, uh, you have in your class. So, uh, whether it's an internship, whether it's a, a field experience, whether it's a, um, some sort of applied learning experience, something that you've done, are currently doing, or you have enough uh, concept that you're going to implement soon. You have enough detail, some, some concept in your head. And I'm going to have a handout for you to think about that and then lay out when and how often will the reflection occur as you're thinking about designing this experience. Where will the reflection occur? And I have some more details on this, this worksheet for you. Who will facilitate the, the reflection? Is it you as the faculty member? Is it other students? Is it a third party? Is it a, um, uh, a teacher that's in, in the public school? It, it, where is, who's doing this? And then um, how will feedback be provided? And so again, getting into the bigger picture of how you're gonna design this, this reflection piece, starting with big picture concepts and, and knowing the strategy for how you wanna do this is going to be helpful. I can hand out a couple up here. Provide a little more detail in here. Provide a little more. It's if you, if you know you do it before and you do it after, but you don't do it in between. Okay, note that. But where is an opportunity for you to, to do this? Take about five minutes to do this. I realize you won't finish but this is something you can go back to, and I can provide the handout that you can use later in, in a different example. some of you who have um, 
I don't have a specific uh, activity example in mind, which makes it much easier. Um, for others that don't have something as concrete, this is a little challenging to do, but you can also think about your own course. You can apply it in different ways. So I would encourage you to, to take this and, and use this individually for yourself, but also use it with your colleagues if you have a shared sort of a, a programmatic ERA or another programmatic um, experience. And this might be a good discussion point um, or discussion starter to have. Are you finding any of them that are difficult to, to determine? Any, any that are difficult to answer? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, the note that I didn't put in here, which I took out just because there wasn't enough room, was that the, the mediums and the product sometimes may be the same. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Um, and there's no right or wrong. I mean, you can use this to to go with to make it what you need, but. Um, I think the medium and, the, and that, the video, for me, brought out another mode or you know, another op opportunity. Um, and, and it might be good for some and not good for others. Uh, students might love it. We might hate it. But it's something that's going to be more prevalent, I think, going forward. I think the biggest issue for me would be looking at the criteria for assessing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> sure. Since so much of this is still so personal mm -hmm. and they're emotive, even if we want them to critically reflect, is there a right or wrong way to do it? Sure. So so um, you have the value rubric for the ERA, which I, I think is, is fine. It gives you some standardization across experiences. Um, Bradley's criteria for assessing reflective learning is, is one that you could use. There's, there's some other options out there. Um, Patty Clayton, in the references here, she has some that are very critical, critical thinking uh, related. She also incorporates a rubric around Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, so they're out there. You can even make your own. Then you get into sort of, you know, is it your own personally, or if you're going to have a common experience across the program, uh, you know, how do you evaluate that? Uh, the same if you have different different rubrics, um, and also have, making sure students understand how they're being graded, obviously, but especially in this, you know, what are you expecting? And also modeling and giving examples for them too. Uh, and so there's plenty of of examples that you could pull from previous, or you could sh show four examples and say, here's how I would make it better. And give them, a, if, if they don't have an example, you're sort of not sure what you're going to get, right? And this is so gray anyway for them, it's hard for students to grasp what you want. You're never gonna get the best work on the first time. It's gonna take, and, and, and so if it's end of week 16, and you're finally getting what you think you want, hopefully you get those students again. Uh, but if there's, in your, in your department, if there's some commonality where you're using the same rubrics, then the students understand, they take intro, they, they kind of know what's expected. By the time they get farther along, they have a better understanding of what the expectations are. Now, I realize that is very difficult to do and everyone wants to do it their own way, but just different ways to think about um, the reflective piece, too. Um, it makes it easier to have a standardized piece. It also um, doesn't give you much flexibility. And so maybe you have three or four standardized sorts of pieces, and then you have a disciplinary piece that is flexible and you can create however you want to. That's, that's a way to do this. So we're coming to the home stretch, but I wanted to um, take the remainder of the time to actually take you through a, a reflective activity here. This is just going through what we just, what we just did. So, how many of you have a laptop? Raise your hand if you have a laptop, something you can type on, a tablet or a laptop. Right now. Right now, yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay, that's, okay. Keep your hands raised high if you have a tablet or a laptop. We are going to do a uh, reflective activity, and we're going to use different mediums different ways to do this. So, I appreciate I appreciate everyone's willingness to take part in your, your assigned reflective activity there. Um, I appreciate the, the folks who volunteered to, uh, to do the video. But the, the point was there that there's, there's many different ways that we could do this. 
and it was less about the content. Uh, I did tell the folks on video we're not doing anything, we're not sharing those videos, you cannot see them, we're going to hit delete, unless you want them. It's up to you. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about kind of how did this go. So, so group A was the, the writers. Let's break that into the folks that were handwriting. What was your experience with this exercise in terms of the, the medium of, of writing by hand on a notepad? How'd that go? Was it something you're comfortable with? Not comfortable? Did it work? Did it not work? I'm sure it was sweet. I guess I'm not a writer. Sure. Okay. I got my on a piece of paper and I sat next to him. Ka Kathy said she would, would have rather done the video. I said, I'm short and sweet. I wrote my writing here on the comments. And I'm sitting next to Dwayne here, who I was sitting next to, and he's writing pages. So I said, well, I guess I'm not the writer. And I probably would have been better in the discussion for, for the video. So you learn what your techniques are. Sure. You know, we, we a, a sidebar conversation we had was uh, you had co-led a study abroad program? Yeah, we went on a study abroad over in Germany this summer. So, you know, we were, you know. Got to know one another pretty well, so but I thought we were sitting there next to one another doing this, and sure. you know, of course, he writes all the time, so I know. That. Well, what an interesting activity to have the same prompting questions for a study abroad group one reflective discussion verbally, one in writing for some a group of students, and one in video, and to see what sort of products you get, what the quality is, what the student preferences are, and sometimes you just need to change things up too, so um, so that's something to consider. What else? The, the, the writers. Anything? Was it easy? For me, I felt like um, the experience that I was trying to write about happened recently, and um, I thought so much about it already and talked to people already that writing about it felt like, I don't know, it, it didn't feel like I was like getting any, anything out of the writing process because I had already like been thinking about it so much. Sure. That's a good point. Yeah. Huh. Okay. What about the, the folks who were typing? Did that think that helped or hindered your <coughs> experience? It hindered mine. It hindered yours. Why? Well, I always want to spell check and go back. And, and so it took me a little bit longer to think about it and put it down because I'm not a typist. So it was just really difficult. OK, writing and editing are two different processes. I was processes, doing it all by right? myself. It was just kind of so OK. Others? I know that there was, yeah, one that, that you, know, you, you needed to move. You needed to have your solitude. <laughs> um, I, I, writing is good for me, and doing it on a, a laptop is, helps it go quicker than handwriting. But um, I do find that a lot of questions come up as I'm writing it out that I'd like to talk to somebody about. Mm. So it's, it, it works well, first of all, but I, I need to follow up. Sure. So a, a second mode might be helpful for you to process. Stephen. I type much, much faster than I write, but I found that I was answering other answers within questions as I was typing. So I had to go back, I would go back and look, and it was like editing as I was writing because I could cut and paste because I'd answered some questions within another question. Sure. So it seems like there may be an opportunity to help students uh, go through the writing process or the reflective process. You know, don't focus on the editing, just, just write what comes to mind, go back and edit it later. Uh, you know, some of those sorts of things. Let's, let's hear from the video folks. What was that experience like? Where are my video folks? I had a couple of different responses. One that, that was similar uh, to one that was already mentioned about having felt like I already reflected so much on this very difficult um, process that I had with a, with a, a particular program. Um, so I felt like maybe there wasn't anything new I was learning, but I did experience significant frustration at the video because I'm such a writer. And I want to be able to write it and look at what I'm writing and go back and make arrows of think about this later, sure. um, action item here. And so I'm so used to that sort of processing that the video piece was pretty frustrating mm -hmm. for me. To okay. not even just have it to look at, like I want to look at it later. Right, go back and edit. Um, I do think I'm also a writer, but I thought it was really interesting because I was able to sort of like just vomit out the words instead of really like worrying about what I was saying if I was making complete sentences. Um, so I think 
it made me think a little bit quicker and maybe say some things that I wouldn't have ever put down on paper um, because just in the process of writing, I would have been like, no, that's dumb. Or, you know, how am I going to fit that into this next sentence and make, you know, so I think that was good. Yeah. Um, I was just able to get all that out there. Good. That's a great observation. We haven't given any time to, we're sort of just going in the moment with, you know, how this went for us. I think that was kind of key, is it was going in the moment, feeling for the video. I started out typing, and so I had one critical issue that I put down, and the moment that I had to put it on video, I was like, hmm, maybe I don't want to talk about that one out loud. <laughs> and so I changed my topic, and I also felt like I didn't get to go through all the questions, and so after I sat down, I went, hmm, I wish I had gone back and thought about this. I wish I had a chance to say something else sure. about that. And something we had talked about earlier, that maybe if it was video, even maybe a, an interview prompt might have been better because, well, what do you think about that? Or how do you think this would have gone? Or something like that may, may be more reflective. So. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, you, it, as we do more of these, you sort of learn how it goes and what, what you can improve, obviously, the continuous improvement. Any other thoughts? But um, I, I'm not suggesting that everything goes digital or it's one mode or another. The idea of this was just to understand, you know, experiencing it as educators, but then putting ourselves in the shoes of students and understanding kind of where their preferences might lie. And if you're not getting what you want, maybe there's another way to do it. Um, or just to change things up, just to try something different for students. And, and it does give us good evidence when you have video or you have, you have this artifact of learning and it can be enhanced and it can be revised. So I'm not suggesting you do one or the other or you don't. I'm just giving you some, some things to think about. So. Um, we're, we're getting close on time, so I don't want to um, talk too much more about these, but um, any closing thoughts on when designing future reflective activity, you will, you know. It, it occurs to me that I'm, I was very uncomfortable handwriting on the spur of the moment because mm -hmm. I'm used to getting it too. But it sort of forced me to give an answer, and I'm thinking that in, in class, I do a lot of different approaches, but I, I feel like I need to tell my students, some of you are going to be uncomfortable with the way we're doing this this time, but you'll, you'll get another chance later. So you think about the people who are not uncomfortable with this one. You know, I think telling them up front might help. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, putting the expectations out there from you as the, as the professor about you understand it's going to take some time. Using the same piece to, to reflect on the reflection. We talked about having students reflect on their own reflective piece, their own reflective writing is a good exercise to allow students to go back after a week or so just seeing, wow, why did I write this? Or what could I do better? And, and so I know you can't dominate your class with writing instruction if it's not a writing uh, intensive course, but there are you know, tips and tools and just you know, things to think about. Any other? Closing thoughts on when designing future reflective activity, you will you will have to reflect some more. <laughs> okay. Well, let's see what we have left here. Um, I have a handout for you that before you go, it's called 10, 10 Tips on Designing Critical Reflection. Um, this is not my it's not my work. It's it's. Um, I have the references and it's the work of uh, multiple people and I found that you know, I was always trying to operationalize. What, I understand what, what you're saying, how do I do it? And so I tried to design this for you so you had some takeaways, you had some things that you could discuss with others that you could use for yourself that would get you to continue progress because you have the willingness. Um, now we just need the tools to, to kind of take that step forward. And, and so this, this one sheet is pretty good. Um, the website at the, at the end of the references, I'm gonna clean this PowerPoint up and send it uh, back to Lilia and she can distribute it um, in a lot of different ways to you. Um, I'm happy to be a resource for you anytime if you have questions. Um, you know, after I'm gone too, that, that's fine. But uh, you have been great, I've, I've really enjoyed this. I was talking to a gentleman back there about you know, all the emails about you know, advising week and scheduling week and, and all the, this is fun. This is the fun stuff for me. You know, I have to go back to all that, all the, the other work here in a little bit. But um, thank you for allowing me to spend some time with you. Uh, it's been a, a great, great couple of days, and uh, we'll see if there's any questions at the end. Well, thank you. Right. Thank you.